Hafa Jay, and welcome to the University of Guam's Press's Creative Conversations. Um, before we get into it, I just wanted to share a little bit about who we are. Uh, the University of Guam Press advances regional scholarship, develops cultural literacy, and expands accessibility to knowledge about Micronesia by providing high-quality, peer-reviewed publishing services. Uh, we have a wonderful collection of local literature, academic publications, and children's books uh, that can all be found on our website www.uog.edu backslash UOG Press. Um, we have a lot of really exciting uh, books coming out in the next few months, including The Properties of Perpetual Light by attorney Julian Uggin. So please visit our website for more information. Um, with generous support from a grant from the Guam Economic Development Authority, uh, UOG Press supports a community of writers through our Manyetluni Mentitsugi Writers Fellowship. Manyetluni Mentitsugi roughly translates into siblings who write. Uh, our fellowship includes a variety of activities intended to support our Manyetlu throughout their writing process, including uh, peer review writing workshops and presentations and discussions with acclaimed authors and artists from our community through this creative conversation series. Um, our, our fellowship also included a wonderful writer's retreat, uh, which we hosted two weeks ago. And uh, in the coming weeks on our social media pages, we will be sharing uh, profiles on the people who attended the retreat. And we will be launching our medium page, uh, Song Song Stories, which will feature some of the writing that was produced during the retreat. So please visit us on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, by looking for UOG Press uh, for more of this exciting uh, opportunity uh, to engage with writers in our community. Um, but without further ado, I'd like to uh, begin this week's Creative Conversations. And I'm sorry, I did, forgot to introduce myself. Guahusi Victoria Lola Leon Guerrero. I'm the Managing Editor of the University of Guam Press. Um, and it has been such a joy to be part of these creative conversations, um, especially throughout COVID, um, as all of us have gone online to really be able to talk about writing and our creative process uh, with people who have a lot of experience uh, in the craft and in publishing. And so um, I'd like to introduce our Mnyetluni Mentitsugi Fellowship Director, Akina Chargloff, who will introduce our presenter for today's creative conversation. Hapade Akina. Day, Lola. Thank you. So today we are incredibly honored to introduce Jamie McDonald Knapp. Jamie joins us all the way from New Jersey, where she's doing amazing work in publishing. Jamie is the director of publicity for Plume and the associate director of publicity for Dutton at Penguin Random House. Uh, just a little brief introduction. Um, since joining Dutton in 2008, she has built buzzworthy and best-selling campaigns for many books, including The Read with Jenna Pick, The Girl with a Louding Voice by Abi Dari, the New York Times bestseller, Trixie and Katya's Guide to Modern Womanhood, and NBA star Andre Iguodala's The Sixth Man, and also The Boy by the number one New or, I'm sorry, number one New York Times bestselling author Tammy Hawk. She has also worked with Drew Barrymore, Nick Offerman, Megan Millay, Phoebe Robinson, Bill Russell, and David Wright, just to name a few. Jamie has also worked at Simon & Schuster prior to joining Dutton and is a graduate of Fordham University. Sizu's Ma'asi, Jamie, for joining us today. If you'd like to share a couple words. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here and to be speaking with you all today. Thank you. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Right, um, so we are, we have two of our fellows here. Uh, we have Joe Titano and Johanna Salinas. Um, so if one of you guys wanna jump in and ask your first question. Oh, did we disconnect? Uh, I'll go ahead and okay. just call yeah. if he doesn't mind. Hafa and welcome Joe. Uh, Joe is one of our Menyetlu in our uh, Menyetlu Ni Mentitsugi Fellowship. He's a recent graduate from the University of Guam and an aspiring author. Hafa Joe. Hafa sorry, I had to turn off my uh, video. I'm kind of dropping out. It's uh, great to be with you guys. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Jamie, for being here. Uh, it's always a pleasure to uh, get to talk to you, all the wonderful people that we get.
I think we just have another fellow joining us, uh, Juliana Santos. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> right. uh, Joe, did you want to start with your first question? Sure. Um, I can. I'm sorry. Can you guys hear me? Am I coming through? Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, oh, I feel like this is such a strong question to start with. I wish I had a <laughs> softball. Um, but. All right. So, so my question is, how do you balance um, when working in publishing like a cultural respectfulness and authenticity against the need to generate hype when you're developing publicity materials for uh, authors who are you know, BIPOC or otherwise you know, diverse authors? Of course. Thank you for that question. It's actually a, a very important question that a lot of us in publishing have been having over the past couple of years. Um, I know for me personally and for the group that I work with, a lot of people look at our materials before they go out into the world. Um, you know, I will, you know, of course, read the book, read every, every sort of material I have about the book, about the author, you know, the manuscript, the author questionnaire, and then I start drafting it. And there's a lot of communication that goes on between me and the author about what their vision for the materials looks like. My director normally looks at it, uh, the editor looks at it, the author and the agent ultimately look at it too before it goes out. Um, on top of that, we have, you know, at Penguin Random House, a really great um, inclusive marketing team that can review all materials um, with a diverse and inclusive lens to make sure that, you know, we are using, you know, the right language when it comes to, you know, what we're talking about. Um, you know, and sometimes, you know, we don't get things right, but, you know, we do have these processes in place to make sure that we try and present, you know, the book and the author as they would want it and as authentic as possible. Thank you, Joe, for your question. Um, next, we have Johanna. Johanna is a poetry lover and works in the Guam Department of Education as a teacher. Johanna, whenever you're ready for your question. Good day, everyone. Hi, nice to meet you, Jamie. So my question is, if you were to write your own book, would you rather write something you would enjoy or would you rather write something that would be easy to promote or market, like something you know that, that would be a seller but you wouldn't really enjoy? Well, writing, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you know this, is writing is such a, a personal thing uh, regardless of what you choose to write about and it's also very time consuming um, you know I think it's very hard for a lot of writers just to churn out you know something um, that's ready to go to market right away so perhaps it could be a I'm going to take the easy way out and say perhaps there's a there'd be a way to combine both <laughs> I'd like to think that there is a you know a market for every book out there and it's just trying to find that consumer and those readers Awesome, thank you. Um, next, we would like to welcome Jelena Santos, who is an aspiring copy editor and enjoys taking part in UOG Press's most recent cohort of writing groups. Hoppede and welcome, Jelena. Hi, Hoppede. Um, thank you so much for uh, sharing your energy today, Jamie. Um, my question today is, what does it take for a campaign to spark active engagement? It's a really great question, and I, it's something that I, I think a lot about um, in trying to, when we have campaigns and trying to find our readers for books. And I, I, I think, and even before, you know, um, you know, the past year where we've had a lot of distractions, I think that for an author to really engage with a, or for a reader to engage with a book or an author is that they kind of have to see it in a couple different places for it to resonate with them. So say you're online and you see a best of you know the summer reading list you see a book there and then perhaps you go on to goodreads and you see the book again and then it's there that you you know then become really curious about it so maybe the next time you're online you decide to google the author and then you come across their social media page and then you know a lot of authors have really great you know communities and that are very active and so i think that's kind of how you know the engagement starts and you know maybe the next time you'll then be curious enough to pick up a copy of the book, you know, whether you buy it or are you, you know, rent it from the library or borrow it from the library. I think, you know, it, you need to see it a couple of times for it to really resonate with you and pique your curiosity. 
Having uh, grown up on Guam, what are some books that you wish you could have read as a as a young reader here in our island? Um, and also, what are some books you wish you could read now as an adult, even being far away from home? Yeah, I think my dad's watching on Facebook, um, so I'll just say hi. <laughs> but, you know, reading was a huge part of our childhood. I think uh, it, sorry if I get this wrong, Dad. I think he had one of the very first library cards um, for the Agania Library. Um, and so growing up, there were always a ton of books um, in our house, you know, Encyclopedia Britannica is, and a lot of historical books. And I was, you know, always, I remember going to a uh, naval base with my grandmother growing up, and she would every now and then let me go to the commissary bookstore. And so I've always had kind of had this love of reading and it wasn't really until I went to college and became an English major that my eyes kind of just opened and I discovered all the different types of books out there because I think as an English major, um, you're, you kind of have to stick with these core classes. You know, it was a lot of Shakespeare. It was a lot of Victorian literature. And yes, a you know, Tess of the Dobervilles is probably one of my favorite books of all time. And I do enjoy a Jane Austen novel, but I think it was the first time I took a Toni Morrison course that I really just, my, my mind just kind of was like, wow, books like this are really great. And I took a whole year of Toni Morrison just kind of going through, I think we spent a whole month on Beloved and I was just like, this is really, really exciting stuff that I just never really caught on to before. Um, and then, you know, once you kind of realize that there, you know, other books out there exist, you know, kind of in that genre, you know, I started reading Caribbean lit. I started reading Asian American lit and then you kind of look for yourself in that those kind of books. And I think, you know, it's an exciting time to be in publishing right now because we're starting to see more voices, um, you know, from Asia, from the Pacific Islands now. Um, I recently read a book called The Son of Good Fortune about Filipino undocumented in immigrants in California. And I was just like, I wish this was the kind of book that we had growing up and I'm glad it is here now. Um, you know, Julian's book, how exciting is that to have a Chamorro author, you know, in being able to see that book out in the world, you know, in, in the next month. So I think that, you know, I wish that you know, growing up, there was more books about, you know, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, but I'm so grateful that they exist now and that I can buy books like that for my children and buy books for, like that for myself. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I think Akina yeah. had a question. Yeah, I'm kind of curious to know, were you always interested in publishing? Like after graduating, was that kind of like the roadmap you wanted to take and expand your career or start your career at that point? Um, to be honest, I had no idea <laughs> what I wanted to do uh, in college, but um, I have, you know, incredible sisters who were older than me, who helped guide me. Um, I remember, you know, in college kind of looking at internships and we were kind of talking about, you know, what I might be interested in. So I applied to a variety of places and my first internship while I was in college was um, at a major network doing corporate communications. And after that internship ended, I kind of thought about, well, I really liked the corporate communications aspect, but I wasn't really particular, you know, particularly excited about the television network and their programming. So then I was lucky enough to find a publicity internship at Playing Random House, which then ended up, uh, I ended up interning at Simon & Schuster, which led to a full-time job. And it's just kind of, now it's been a very long time. Awesome. All right, um, I believe our fellows have a second round of questions that you can go around. Um, anyone like to jump in? Hi, again. Okay, so um, I have a question. I guess it's kind of like similar to um, maybe what Joe was asking at first, but uh, I guess it might not be too similar. So how do you cope when trying to promote or market a book that you might not agree with? Like, like you know, um, as like Pacific Island women, we try to empower each other, but what do you do if you find something that might not be all that empowering or might just, you, it might go against what you believe in. Thank you, that's a really important question. And it's, it's definitely something that 
you know, the publishing world has had to reckon with more, you know, in a more serious manner in the past few years. And I think, you know, whether it's at work or it's at home, it's really important to have a support system and psychological safety. Um, and luckily I have those. I've been working with the same team for a very long time. And I'm also an active member in the DEI, the Diversity, Inclusion um, and e Equity Committee, where we talk openly about these issues, both in and out of publishing, and we meet regularly. So I think that, you know, when you have those two things, it, it makes it, you know, not so much easy, but easier to kind of, you know, cope in certain ways when you don't agree with, you know, whether it's, you know, the content or the author, it, it makes it a little bit easier. Yeah, I think one of the amazing things about having like workshop groups and doing publishing within our community is that, um, which is very different from having been in workshop groups in graduate school and even in the Bay Area as progressive and open as it is, what I was realizing and sharing uh, with Akina the other day is like, it's amazing that we have this group of writers and we don't have to explain ourselves all the time. So there's always this expectation because there is a big void for books from Guam that we always have to keep explaining ourselves and situating ourselves. And so as an artist, that can be a bit exhausting, right? It's kind of like always our responsibility ability to define ourselves for the world but um you know it's like the it, it's like the expectation is that we don't want the reader to work too hard right and so it's kind of liberating i think to be creating this community of writers where it's like no our intention is to publish our stories as they are and in their true artistry and to kind of have each other has been also really good. So I, I liked what you shared about having a team. Um, but I do wonder about that because you know, you're coming from the angle of wanting to market books. So when writers are writing about Guam and, and hope to reach both a Guam audience, but a larger worldwide audience, how do you, what kind of advice do you have in terms of striking that balance, not sacrificing sort of the art in order to explain so much but how much should they explain? And what do you think uh, kind of should be the thinking around this? I mean, I, I think that if it's your story and it's how you feel and if it's how you perceive, you know, your story to be, then that's how it should be published. And I think often the challenge is trying to find, like you said, the community that views it in the same way. Um, you know, it's one thing to be wanting to, you know, spend a lot of time creating something that means so much to you than to have, you know, an editor or a publisher say, no, you know, this isn't, this isn't, isn't going to sell or it's never going to read. No, no one's ever going to read this. You know, it's much better to find a community that values your opinion, um, whether or not other people agree. And then that way, you know, you have, you know, you have someone in your team that has your interests at heart and then can help you publish and market and publicize the, the book in the way you see it. Thank you. Um, does anyone else want to follow up with their second question? I can go. Um, you know, one thing I was wondering, one thing that can be very daunting for um, authors who are trying to break into the market is figuring out like what route should they take uh, in order to get themselves published. And, um, you know, Dutton is, I guess it's more of like a boutique, uh, but working with Random House or a big publisher, what are some of the benefits of working with like a bigger publishing house? And I'm also wondering, like, what sorts of authors might be better served, um, maybe going with a more independent uh, publishing house or even self-publishing? Thank you. That's a great question. Um, I've only ever worked at big publishing houses, <laughs> so I can only speak to my experience. But I think there are a lot of pros and cons to both. And I think ultimately it, you know, it's you got to have to sort of do the research. So if you look at some of your favorite books, and your favorite authors and books that you um, are fans of, you know, see who published them, see who their editors are, see, you know, who their agents are. And then, you know, you can kind of put it into perspective that way. When you put your book on a shelf, is it sitting next to those other authors? And are those agents and those houses, do they have a similar vision for your book as, you know, as, as you do? And then maybe you have your answer that way of whether, you know, are all those houses public, are all those books and authors published by Penguin Random House? Are they published by UOG Press? Are they published by, you know, another house? And then you can kind of go that route. I hope that answer, answers your question. Yeah, awesome. That was really helpful. Thank you. 
So um, we just got a question from Ophelia Rose online. She says, Sidza Usma'asi, what's the most culturally significant piece you've worked on? Thank you, Ophelia. Um, last, uh, in the past couple of years, I was um, very humbled to work on a book by Abby Dari called The Girl with the Louding Voice. And Abby is a debut novelist. And this is something where she had a full-time job and she was just trying to write at night. And she blindly sent in her book to, uh, into a writing contest and ended up winning and ended up getting matched with an agent. And the book is about a young girl in Nigeria who is kind of has the odds stacked against her. She is born, um, you know, into a poor family and then her mother passes away and her mother says, the only thing I want for you is to get an education. So all she wants for herself is to get an education. And so you follow this young girl, Aduni, all she wants is to, you know, have the right to speak for herself. And it was in, an incredibly moving publication process in, in making sure that we get that message about, it's like, not only is it about our author and the story of Aduni, but it's also the story of young girls um, around the world and championing education for girls and what girls can do, you know, if they are given the opportunity to have an education. Um, so I think that, you know, in the past couple of years, getting to work on that really special book has really, you know, moved me a lot and hopefully moved a lot of readers too. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, we did receive several questions um, from our fellows that weren't able to join in today. Um, so one of the questions were, um, if you were to write your own book, would you rather write something you enjoy or write something you know would be easy to promote slash market? Oh, that was mine. Oh, oh, sorry. Sorry, Johanna. Sorry, ask your question. Yeah, yeah. I already, oh, sorry. Um, oh, okay. Uh, maybe uh, you can ask maybe Megan's question. Megan's question. Uh, actually, we have another one about YouTube partners. Um, how does it work when book community YouTube partners our YouTubers partner with Penguin Random House or give it advanced reader copies of books. So I guess like the partnership between Penguin Random House and YouTube. Um, I think every imprint pretty much, you know, has their own set of guidelines for how they work with uh, booktubers and bookstagrammers and bloggers. But um, I know that our marketing team does a, an incredible amount of research and outreach to readers. Um, and we don't do paid campaigns, but we do offer you know, free copies of books um, in exchange for honest reviews and, you know, hope that fosters communities and a lot of readers. So we got another question uh, online from Lena McDonald. She's asking, is e-publishing affecting the book market? No. Um, I, you know, I, I feel like since I've started in publishing, there's been a lot of, you know, worry that you know, uh, ebooks are going to, you know, hurt the publishing industry as a whole. And we actually saw within the past year, um, I, I hope I'm saying this accurately, is that physical books, physical, physical book sales were actually up last year, um, just because a lot of people were at home and they really wanted that experience of, you know, holding a physical book. So ebook sales, I believe are still strong, but I think, you know, people are really returning it in, in you know, finding their love for the physical book again. Yeah, it's been really interesting for us as well, because with, you know, kind of this new wave of publishing, it's the same people want the physical book, they want it signed by the author, they want the experience. So um, we've been really successful with print versions of the books that we're publishing. Um, a question I have is that, um, you know, it's, how do you sustain interest in books that are from a place that is it's is so distant even to sort of like um so right now in promoting julian's book for example like initially people are responding so i, I send out the pitch and i ask if they want to review it and i send out the book and then it just goes silent based on what's happening in the world so there was all this interest and then the riot happened and then there was then and then I started to hear back again and then it was the inauguration and then it was the impeachment trial so Guam is very small and distant in a lot of people's imaginations and um and it's really interesting because this is something I always remind people is that for us like 
American, um, you know, the American education system, American media, American perspectives are so heavily imposed upon us here. We know so much about uh, United States experience because of all of colonization. And so, but it's not, it doesn't work the other way around. And it isn't until you leave home that you really realize that, you know, most people don't know anything about Guam. And often what they do know about Guam is very insulting and racist and, and minimizing. And, you know, it's, um, and so we're doing a lot of work now to recenter our story, to create textbooks books for our schools to create this kind of literature that again, as I mentioned, first and foremost, allows our community to have a conversation with these texts. But when we care also about others understanding their impacts on us, but they don't see it as important, right? And so that's kind of been an interesting struggle in terms of marketing Guam books outside of Guam. It's that I know that it could be really interesting to a non-Guam readership. Um, I think that a book like Julian's is very important for people to understand understand a larger global perspective and even for Americans to understand that you still have a colony in 2021 and you should read about what it's doing to the people there, you know, so um, I, I wanted to know because you're in publicity, how do you sustain that interest when it sort of seems like if something else happens, Guam gets pushed off, right? The same thing happened in the North Korea threat. We had like literally two seconds of people caring about Guam and then it just so quickly went away and nobody remembered anymore. Um, I think one of the people I was talking to about Julian's book literally said to me, I've never even said the word Guam before I met you. So how do how you know what advice do you have in terms of sustaining that interest and making sure that these books that do deserve a larger readership get out? I mean, it's it is a really tough time to be um, a publicist and a marketer, you know, especially in the past year. I you know, I used to take regular meetings with, you know, national bookers, uh, producers and reviewers. And, you know, it's been hard to get attention because, you know, they're like us. They're working from home. They're working in their child's bedroom, you know. Um, and I think it really just comes down to persistence. And I think, you know, the one exciting thing that we have seen, you know, in the past few years is that there definitely is a hunger for more diverse voices. Um, and we're seeing it a lot in the books that are being bought. We're seeing it a lot in the books that are coming to market. And we're seeing a lot in, in bookstores now when you go, you walk into a bookstore, you know, here on the mainland and you look at the displays, just the variety of different voices that are being represented. So I think it's just, you know, publishing right now isn't it just about when the book comes out and what happens at, you know, during that first week. Now we're looking at, you know, does a can a campaign have a really long tail? Will this book sell six months from now? Will it sell a year from now? Will it sell two years from now? And so that's kind of what we've been looking when we publish books now is that we just got to keep, we're in it for the long haul. Um, and, you know, it is a really exciting time, you know, to see diverse voices because they're, I think, you know, there are books out there that, you know, I, like I said, you know, I, I read a book, um, this book, this book, The Girl with the Louding Voice, like I have no connection to Nigeria, but that book touched me in such, you know, a, a profound way and has touched readers all across the world that, you know, hopefully someone will hear about a story like Julian's in his book and have no connection to Guam or Chamorro, but really resonates with them somehow. And then, you know, hopefully that's how we build a movement and, and build awareness. Absolutely. And I think that's the power of books is that it breaks down, you know, these made up borders and boundaries that keep us from each other. And I think that's why I care so passionately about this work. And it's, it's so fun is because there's so much possibility, right? I always tell writers, it's probably the one thing I say all the time time is the universal is in the specific like you don't have to over generalize you just have to be yourself and someone will see themselves in you and so um you know this this program is really cool because all of our writers are different ages and from different backgrounds but um all of their stories have these interesting intersections um and it's just so much possibility in terms of telling guam's story to the world um, that said, I'd like to uh, invite Jelena to ask our next question. Um, hello. Uh, so this most recent part of the conversation is pretty interesting to me. Like, say you have like first time um, 
aspiring novelist that has um, that's from Guam and she wants to publish her novel. And um, I, I'm curious because it sounds a lot like it's important to educate readers as just to get them to read the book that you are trying to publish. And so like how much of the responsibility of educating an audience is the publishers or is, um, yeah, is the publishers and is the authors or is like, is a first time author, uh, can a first time author comfortably like hope that whoever she ends up publishing with sort of teams with her or him to help educate, you know, a wider audience so people are interested in reading the book? That's a great question. And that, and that kind of, um, I think it's kind of similar to what Joe asked before about, you know, what kind of uh, publisher or press. And I think that is something also as a, as a debut writer is if you look at other writers that you admire, you know, you can kind of see what they've done. Are they really active on social media? Do they have a really great website? Have they published, you know, pieces on Medium? Dot com? Have they, you know, done a bunch of, you know, local poetry events? Um, because, you know, I think it does take a little bit of both, you know, you have your talent, you have your, your, your art, you have your book, but then you also need the resources of, you know, a publisher who can help, you know, guide you to have your book be the best possible version of itself and an editor who cares about you and a marketing and a, and a publicity team behind you too. So it, it does go hand in hand. Uh, we did receive a question from one of our fellows and she, her question is, what qualities make best selling literature? Oh man, that's hard. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think it really depends. I mean, there's so many, when you look at the bestseller list now, um, which is something that I do regularly, there's so many different types of books that reach so many different types of audiences. Um, so it really just, you know, it's, it's like lightning in a bottle. You just got to catch it. Um, so I, I don't really have an answer. I wish I did, because otherwise I, I'd have all bestsellers. <laughs> so something that would be, I think, really interesting is sort of how did your experience growing up in Guam uh, impact sort of your instincts and the decisions you make in your career? Um, you know, I think oftentimes people think that um, you kind of have to leave Guam to be successful, but I think that in reality, Guam really prepares us for, you know, some really major things that we do in our lives. And so if you could kind of speak to that and even just, you know, what are some experiences um, people should consider getting into here that if they're into this kind of work uh, would be really beneficial to them. Well, I think right now, you know, one of the things that this pandemic has shown is that you really have the ability to work from anywhere. And, you know, there are a lot of publishing houses, you know, that are actively seeking interns or assistants, and you don't have to live in New York to do that kind of work anymore. Um, we have people in our department who are working on the West Coast with us. So, you know, if you're interested in working, you know, at a publishing house in the States or just getting that kind of experience. Right now is a really great time to, you know, start you know, polishing your resume and, and sending out queries, taking uh, informational interviews because you don't have to be in New York anymore. For a long time, that was kind of the idea of, you know, publishing is that you had to be in New York, but now you can, you can be anywhere. Um, and I think, you know, growing up on Guam is just really, is just a, there's nothing else like it. <laughs> You know, it's hard to explain to someone who's never been to Guam what it's like to grow up on Guam. I know that when we were prepping it, before the call started, I, I, maybe it was you, Lola, I heard the rooster in the background. And it's like, it's moments like that where it's, it's hard <laughs> to explain to someone who, who didn't have that kind of childhood. But I mean, I think that, you know, I come from, you know, parents who worked very long and continue to work very long and, and hard hours and that, you know, that being proud of their work. And that's something that I have, you know, worked very hard is that, you know, publishing is not an easy job and especially publicity, I get turned down a lot. <laughs> I get a lot of, I got, I, you know, like you said, you send out a lot of emails and sometimes you're lucky to get a response, but a lot of times it's just pure rejection. And it's just that 
hard work that's been ingrained in me, you know, through my parents, through my grandparents, um, and seeing how hard they work and how hard my sisters work. I think that's really just kind of that mentality that I, I keep with me because it it is kind of uh, I think about it a lot is as like wow I'm from Guam and I work in Manhattan and I work in a publishing house and I publish these beautiful books and it's sometimes I still kind of am in all of this life and this career that I have built when I'm sitting on the subway and I see a, a random stranger reading a book that I worked on I want to you know go and say like oh, how'd you hear about this book what was it did you see the author here? And he, sometimes I have to stop myself because I don't want to come off as being weird. <laughs> but, I, you know, I think it's that, you know, that hardworking mentality that, um, you know, I saw growing up a lot that has really guided me through this. Oh, that really spoke to me because I, I feel the same way. Like, I think that um, that's what I'm most grateful for is just that work ethic. But more than anything, I think it really is rooted in like our value for each other that we have here. You know, that it's like, when you work hard, you're this representation of your family, of your village, of, you know, and, and it's kind of like, um, part, of, it's rooted in that reciprocity, that enough at Malik, like the harder I work, the better it'll be for my family and vice versa. Um, and I think, you know, what you said about seeing someone reading the book, it's like, we care about each book that we make, like we do our children, you know, like, it's like a new life, you know, and, and I think that's one thing I always like when a new writer comes to us, and they're like, Oh, it's already done. I just need it. You know, I just need someone to put it together and print it. And I'm like, Oh, no, no. <laughs> like A book takes takes lots of drafts and lots of time and you've got to give it that care because it really will become a life of its own you know and and I think once you go through that process it's like it really transforms your relationship to books and um and I think with the Chamorro work ethic it it really it means a lot you know because it is you representing not just yourself but you know your people your family to the world um in a new life and so um that's really neat that you're able to apply that and they're lucky to have a chamorro woman in that way you know helping to promote these books so thank you i think akina had another question Yes, um, I'm kind of curious to know what types of books and genres are trending right now? You know, I think with a lot of the um, civil rights um, in Black Lives Matter movement last year, social justice, those books are, you know, selling a lot because people want to learn more about those issues and how to, you know, tackle those issues head on. I, I think there's also, um, you know, a lot of the books that are selected by the National Book Clubs, like the Hello Sunshine, Reese Witherspoon's Book Club, um, a lot of women's fiction is, is doing really well right now, too. Oh, but also uh, coloring books are also doing really well, <laughs> especially in the past year. We, we published a, a couple of really fun books. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Those are selling really well because people are looking for stuff to do while they're stuck at home. Thank you, Jamie. Um, I think Joa has uh, another question. All right. So I, you know, I'm wondering um, with, and you know, nowadays with everything kind of like Amazon eating up so much of um, book sales um, throughout the U.S. Um, in print and especially in through like eBooks. I was wondering if there's, do you guys do anything in order to like help or support or just work with kind of um, smaller booksellers? or bookstores like mom and pop operations? Yes, we do a tremendous amount of outreach to independent bookstores here in the States. And, um, you know, whether it's uh, outreach to them to let them know about upcoming uh, books that they might like and authors who they might like, but we also try to do a lot of events with them too, especially when we have a really big name on our list. We try to, you know, partner with a local bookstore so that, you know, they benefit from not only the event and the book sales of the event, but for all the foot traffic or the virtual traffic that comes in through the store. So yes, independent bookstores are really wonderful. So if you have the option of buying, you know, from an independent bookstore, uh, you know, I, I really would recommend that. Awesome. Johanna. 
Hi, so I have a question about like those giveaway contests. Like I see it on Instagram, they say just like tag a friend and such and like I try it and um, I was just wondering is like, do I not win because I am on Guam and Guam participants, Guam participants can't like win on those like author giveaways and such? I think it all depends on, you know, who is holding the contest, but it is kind of annoying that a lot of people won't ship to Guam. <laughs> so that that could have, you know, something to do with it. But I, I think it also, you know, a lot of these giveaway contests, you know, they, they get, you know, thousands of thousands of entries. So it could also just, you know, be that there are a lot of other participants. I know before we went live, we were talking about like touring and author book readings and tours. And I thought about it when you were discussing the smaller booksellers. Um, so it's interesting because like you said, because of COVID, it's like you're able to go to parts of the world you wouldn't have been able to. So I, I think like in some ways, publishing houses are saving money, right? You're not like flying someone all over the world. Um, but on the other end of the spectrum, it's like, you know, I think people might be sort of tiring of the virtual events. And so how do you strike that balance? What are some creative approaches that the industry is taking to allow writers to connect with their readers? We are, you know, starting to see some virtual fatigue. Um, I think in, in the beginning it was, you know, we had a lot of people tuning in because everyone was stuck at home and it was kind of a new and novel thing. But now that we're a year in, we are definitely seeing fatigue. So, you know, so kind of some things that we're, you know, we do a lot of incredible research into numbers um, and looking at all the da data from all the events that we've had. And what we're seeing now is that an author doing one to two events is much better than an author doing five to 10. Um, and if an author can do it in conversation with another author or, you know, someone else who can bring their own followers to it, it is a, a it could be a really successful event. Um, but it is, you know, like I said, um, before we started is that it's really hard to see what the fall is going to bring because uh, we're starting to look at our fall campaigns and whether we can be having virtual events um, or in-person events and what will it look like and it, it's really hard to gauge so I, it'll be interesting whether people want to return to that even. I know definitely it's kind of like oh well we we opened this big door right of like we can just do it all online and you know save money save like fossil fuels so um but yeah how much how long can it sustain itself when the world opens back up i guess we'll find out but i have really enjoyed the ability though to um like i remember in the beginning like all the concerts like when erica badu and jill scott had their uh uh, Erica Badu versus Jill Scott because of the time difference it ended up being Mother's Day and that was like the best Mother's Day morning because I was just like wow <laughs> like never before would I have been able to do something like that um, so it's interesting um, so I think uh, Joe has another question um, yeah I was wondering um, what was your who, what was your favorite author to work with and who's an author that you'd really like to work with in case they're watching the UOG Press live stream right now. Maybe they can hear this. Well, I'm lucky. I, I've been able to work with a, a really, really wonderful authors. Um, and I've, you know, had some really exciting opportunities to go on book tour before and, you know, through work, be able to visit cities that I never thought I would visit or, you know, go to events that I, I never thought would be possible. Um, so it's, it's hard to pick a favorite. Um, and authors who I'd like to work with there. I mean, honestly, there's a lot. <laughs> I, you know, it's something that when I read a book that I, you know, if I, you know, if I, I love it, I, I hold, hold on to it. And I think about it a lot. I recently um, just finished um, the son of good fortune. And um, now I'm really going to apologize to the author because I, his name escapes me. <laughs> but I mean, I think that he is an incredible Leslie Tenorio. He is a Filipino American writer. And I think like he is an incredible talent. And I, I can't wait to see what he does next. And, you know, hopefully when he is writing his next book that, you know, we just so happen to, you know, be part of the conversation as to who he'll publish with. 
you just reminded me of how before when I would like go to bookshops and like use bookstores, anytime I saw a name that sounded like it could be from Guam, I would just buy it. <laughs> I'd be like, so like a Tenorio, like I would have just bought that book. So I'm like, oh, Leslie Tenorio, let me fancy. <laughs> Is there any connection? Um, but I think like how you were talking earlier about um kind of like see, you know, now that there is an emergence of voices from all over the world, like there are these connections, like whether it be a name, whether it be uh, food that's written about, but, you know, um, I just hope that there will be uh, more from Guam too, right? Like other scenarios and then they're in conversation with each other. So um, I think Akina was saying, we have another question from Facebook. You wanna ask that key? Sure. So this question is from Selena Onadera Salas. Um, she has two questions actually. Um, how well do publications written in other languages sell? And the follow-up is, is there a demand for translated work? Could you say the first question again? I'm sorry. Sure. Um, how well do publications written in other languages sell? You know, to be honest, I don't know. Um, you know, within my own group, we don't publish a lot of translated works. Uh, we do, <laughs> we actually do have a very popular crime series that we do work with um, from a, a Danish crime thriller writer, uh, UC Adler Olsen. And he is, you know, Denmark's number one crime writer. We do quite well just because Scandinavian thrillers are really popular. I think it started with The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo and now there's Lars Kepler. There's Sarah Bladell so, and UC Adler Olsen. So I know that, you know, there are certain genres that are huge when they're translated, but I, I'm just not too sure about, you know, other genres. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Jelena, I know you had another question. I don't know how much data you guys, um, you guys uh, keep as far as who ends up buying your books, but are there any times that like, a publishing house is surprised by who ends up buying um, a published book or a recently published book? A lot of our work is actually driven by data. We have a lot of different teams that analyze everything from what regions, um, you know, bought the most copies of a certain book to, you know, where a lot of our, you know, sub newsletter subscribers live. So a lot of it is, you know, uh, based on data and there have been some times and I can't think of a, a like a, a specific one but there have been times where you know we've had a, a book in and we thought that the reader was you know a certain type of reader and it ended up being a much different person but um, we do and I think most publishing houses do rely a lot on you know the the data that they they have on their readers. Wonderful. Well, I'd like to thank all of our fellows for your wonderful questions and to those tuning in online. Um, Jamie, it's so fun to, to talk with someone from home that's doing such great work. And as I shared with you before, when you're ready to move home, we would love to continue working with you. Um, it's, it's you keep having that 69 degree weather, I might. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. I consider. laughs> um, but did you want to say some closing remarks any last things you'd like to say before we close out no I, I just thank you so much for having me it, it, it's really exciting to hear you know what you guys are, are doing you know both with the UOG press and with your own writing you know that writer's retreat sounds amazing and you know I encourage you to, to keep doing it you know we like I said there is a hunger and a demand for more diverse voices. So there, there's, you know, keep it up and, and let's let's hear your stories. Viva, thank you. Um, and that's a wonderful uh, transition into uh, my reminder that coming this week, we will begin posting um, information about our upcoming blog, Song Song Stories, which will be on uh, Medium. And we're gonna start the blog off by featuring profiles on each of our retreat participants and a little bit of the writing that they did during the retreat. So um, please tune in to our Instagram page uh, and our Facebook page for information. Um, also, this 
this week is the Marianas History Conference hosted by um, a wonderful collective of organizations from throughout the Marianas. And so uh, we will be presenting on Monday at 4 p.m. on a panel about publishing. Um, and we will have Julian there as well presenting about his book. So um, if you just look up Marianas History Conference online, you can get the Zoom link and register for the conference. It's all free. Um, there is incredible scholars uh, from throughout the world writing about the Marianas uh, that will be presenting over the next 10 days. Uh, last night was the opening and there was a wonderful panel about Femalawan and the, the role of women in our lives. So please tune into the Marianas History Conference. Like I said, UOG Press will be presenting on Monday at four. Um, and we will be uh, continuing these creative conversations next month. So stay tuned and have a beautiful Saturday. And Jamie, have a wonderful Friday evening. Thank you for your time. And we look forward to talking with you again more in the future. Esta Joss.